Well, I always like to use the metaphor of an orange. I love the orange. Perhaps living in Florida is why, but... <laughs> an orange is a simple metaphor. You take this orange and you squeeze it as hard as you can squeeze it. And you ask yourself, what will come out? And what comes out when you squeeze an orange? Orange juice. Never, no matter how many times you squeeze it, will apple juice come out. There's no mistakes. You'll never get grapefruit juice out of this thing, ever. The only thing you'll ever get out of it is orange juice. And the next question is why? Why when you squeeze an orange, as hard as you can squeeze it, does orange juice come out? And I asked that question up in Toronto one time, and this little girl sitting right in the front row, she said, that's dumb. <laughs> it's a, it, she said, that's what's inside. It has to come out. I said, well, that's the answer. <laughs> you are really smart. And she smiled and she thought that was great. But that's the truth. The reason that orange juice comes out when you squeeze it is because that's what's inside. Now you extend the metaphor and someone squeezes you. That is, someone says something about you that you don't like. Someone behaves towards you in a way that you find offensive. Somebody does something or says something to you that you feel hurt by. And out of you comes anger, hatred, bitterness, tension, fear, anxiety, stress. And immediately you say, the reason that comes out of me is because of how he said it, or the way that she said that, or because they did that. But the truth is, the reality is, that what comes out is what's inside. And if you don't like what's inside, you can change it. Now, if you ask me, how does orange juice get inside of an orange, I would say, I don't know. I can't figure it out. That's a mystery to me. I just enjoy the oranges of my life and give God the credit for that. There's a wonderful poem. I'd like to share this poem with you. It's uh, written by a wonderful woman. Her name is Valerie Cox. And she lives up in Seattle, and she's written quite a bit of poetry. This particular poem really speaks to me to the difference between what you know and what you believe in. Immerse yourself in, this, in these words. A woman was waiting at an airport one night with several long hours before her flight. She hunted for a book in the airport shop, bought a bag of cookies, and found a place to drop. She was engrossed in her book, but happened to see that the man beside her, as bold as could be, grabbed a cookie or two from the bag between, which she tried to ignore to avoid a scene. She munched cookies and watched the clock as this gutsy cookie thief diminished her stock. She was getting more irritated as the minutes ticked by, thinking, if I wasn't so nice, I'd blacken his eye. With each cookie she took, he took one too. And when only one was left, she wondered what he'd do. And with a smile on his face and a nervous laugh, he took the last cookie and broke it in half. He offered her half as he ate the other. She snatched it from him and thought, oh, brother, this guy has some nerve and he's also rude. Why, he didn't even show any gratitude. She had never known when she had been so galled and sighed with relief when her flight was called. She gathered her belongings and headed to the gate, refusing to look back at the thieving ingrate. She boarded the plane and sank in her seat, then sought her book, which was almost complete. As she reached in her baggage, she gasped with surprise. There was her bag of cookies in front of her eyes. I love that. I love that. If mine are here, she moaned with despair, then the others were his, and he tried to share. Too late to apologize, she realized with grief that she was the rude one, the ingrate, the thief. I've often said that in any relationship in which two people agree on everything, one of them is unnecessary. <laughs> so it isn't about getting somebody who's just like you. In fact, your soulmate is the person that you have a lot of difficulty with. Your soulmate's the person you can't get rid of. They just keep showing up. You, you, you say this, they say that, and there they are. They're back again. And they never go away. They keep showing up in your life. And everybody has these people. These are our greatest teachers because anybody in your life who can push a button and send you into a frenzy is the person who's your greatest teacher. You know why? Because they teach you that you haven't mastered yourself at this moment. You don't know how to choose peace. 
In A Course in Miracles, there's a wonderful line that says, I can choose peace rather than this. Whatever it is, I can choose peace. My soulmate, my wife is one of my soulmates. I mean, she knows how to push those buttons. She's really good at it. And she's one of my greatest teachers. I remember saying to her one time, Honey, do you love me for who I am or for what I've been able to do for you? I just want to... She said, that, you call yourself a spiritual person? I can't believe you would even ask a question like that. She said, I don't love you for what you can buy for me or what success that you've had or where you are on any bestseller list. I love you for who you are. And I will always love you. I said, well, I was just asking. I said, what if I was just Joe Sixpack? You know, and I was just bringing home, you know, a, a, a meager salary and so on. She said, I will always love you for who you are. She said, I would miss you. <laughs> but I would always love you. She knows. She's got that. You know. And all of us have soulmates. My daughter, Serena, who's uh, just turned 13, my teeny bopper. She came home from school one day, she said, there's a rumor in our school. She saw, somebody had seen me on television, that you actually wrote a book about how to raise children. Tell me it isn't true. <laughs> I said, honey, you can come and hear me speak. Would you like to come and hear me speak? I said, people actually pay to hear me speak. She said, why? <laughs> well, she's, she's got that, all right? She's, she's, but her soulmate is her sister, Summer who is now almost 15. But when Serena was 12 and Summer was 14, my wife was away working on a book of hers and I was taking care of everything at home while she was working on her book about a spiritual approach to childbirth and infancy care. And she's as qualified as anybody to write about that, I can tell you. And I was making breakfast, I was making waffles for them in the morning at the toaster. And uh, <laughs> she mixes all this stuff up, it's a lot easier to just put them in. And Summer and Serena were sitting at the back table in the kitchen. And I heard Summer say to Serena, out of nowhere, about 6.30 in the morning, if you didn't have any feet, would you wear shoes? <laughs> and I turned around, I said, where is this going? <laughs> and, so, and Serena went, that's ridiculous. What do you mean if I didn't have any feet, would I wear shoes? She said, of course not. And Summer said to her, then why are you wearing that bra? <laughs> Everybody's got a soulmate. <laughs> Stormed out of the room and it was all. But it isn't the people who agree with us, it isn't the people who tell us the right thing, it isn't the people who always uh, find us, you know, just perfectly smelling good and so on. There is an element of understanding that everybody who shows up in our life has something to teach us.